obligation to enroll, call the Your Medicare Benefits Help Center now at 800-985-9143. That's 800-985-9143. One of the persons uh, who has made this book grant possible for the last five years. Sorry about my another thing. Go ahead, Shamiko. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'll start off by talking a little bit about the Janadian Pharmacist Book Grant, and then I'll talk about pharmacists rising to the challenge in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So about five years ago, a group of us decided to start a book grant, um, which was specifically geared to a second or third year student in the School of Pharmacy at UTEC. And we decided to do this because we were looking back at where we were coming from and we realized that the foundation that we got at UTEC was the best bar none. Mm -hmm. Most of us are leaders um, in our respective areas of pharmacy here in Canada. Uh, most of us are either um, managers in retail or managers in non-retail setting. And we were looking at candidates that we were interviewing and, you know, just comparing the candidates who were trained outside of Canada in comparison to the candidates who were, tr who were trained across Canada. And we were finding that persons who were trained outside of Canada, specifically at UTEC, and this is not us being biased, seem to do a lot better in interviews. And they seemed to do a lot better in the working environment. They were able to adapt more. They were able to just do the simple little thing of thinking outside of the box and finding that solution for patients that we desperately required. And so we decided that we wanted to help a student at the time to be able to have the resources required to complete their program. And in terms of resources, we're looking at books because if you don't have the books or the subscriptions that you require, it, it's often very challenging to get what you want to get done. And so we decided to do a book grant. So at the time, um, five of us came together and we said, okay, we were going to give 500 Canadian dollars to one student for a book grant. The following year, we decided that we were going to up the amount to $600 and we we're going to do two book grants of 300 each. And we've continued on that trend since then. And I must say, we've had some really good um, recipients. Um, a lot of them has reached out to us and they've said, you know, thank you so much. Um, it's been a blessing to us. It's helped us to, you know, get books and supplies that we never thought um, possible. A lot of them are like persons who are struggling, you know, just to continue to be in pharmacy school, continue to get in all the required um, books and supplies. I myself had benefited from a book grant from the Lions Club when I was at UTEC. So I know what it's like to, you know, need the resource and not have it readily available and then have somebody step in um, to provide it for you. And so we want to continue to do this um, moving forward in the future. And then I'm just going to touch a little bit about what we're doing right here now in Canada. Um, pharmacists rising to the challenge of leadership and innovation in a healthcare crisis. I practice in Alberta, and as many of you know, um, in Alberta, we have one of the widest scopes of practice of pharmacy anywhere in the world, bar none. And I say that because not even in Ontario or some of the more populated provinces have the scope of practice that we have. And I'll go through some of the stuff that we, we do here in Alberta. And I was reading an article recently and I realized that the, the Canadian Pharmacists Association has said that pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare providers in Canada. And this even became more evident with the onslaught of COVID-19. This is um, this is that girl, uh, she was the president of the student group one time, um, Tami Tamika. Uh, Margaret. <laughs> Please mute. Sorry, Margaret, please mute. Go so, ahead. So prior to COVID-19 here in Alberta, um, we have what is called additional prescribing authorization. And I do have an additional prescribing authorization and I'll explain about that a little bit further. We do point of care testing for A1C. Um, we do administration of drugs by injections and I will differentiate that from the administration of vaccines. Um, we do chronic disease management. Um, 
adaptations, extensions, renewals of prescriptions, diagnosing and treating minor ailments will fall under um, additional prescribing authorization. We do medication reviews, um, initial access prescribing also falls under additional prescribing authorization. We do wellness programs, um, we order and interpret lab tests, and no, with the onslaught of COVID-19 pandemic, we've realized that all of these services that we've been offering has increased exponentially. And I'll say, um, just for example, before I would maybe do two or three prescribing per week in my practice. And since COVID-19, that has increased by about a thousand percent. Between March and I would say September, I was doing initial access prescribing for anxiety and depression, like maybe four or five prescriptions per day. And prior to COVID-19, I wasn't doing that. That wasn't the focus of my practice. Most of my prescribing would be around UTIs. So with COVID-19, my ability to prescribe shot up exponentially, exponentially and I was doing a whole lot of prescribing more than I would before. When you look at um, administering drugs by injection, in some provinces, um, pharmacies are allowed to administer drug by injections, while some provinces allow pharmacies to administer vaccines. And I try to make the distinction because in Ontario, pharmacies are allowed to administer vaccines, while in Alberta, pharmacies are allowed to administer drugs by injection. And the difference is it is vaccines plus other drugs. Before COVID-19, I had never administered Zolaire, I'd never administered Ilaris, I'd never administered um, Ceftriaxone, I am. And with COVID-19, when all the physicians' offices closed, everybody started coming to us. The first time I had a patient scheduled to do an Ilaris injection, to be honest with you, I was super nervous because when I looked at the cost of the drug, 18,000 Canadian dollars, one drug, one mil um, inside the vial, I need to pull that drug outside of the vial because it's not a preloaded syringe and I need to give that drug via subcutaneous injection. Honestly, it was very nerve wracking for me, but I just had to talk myself into it. The patient doesn't have a choice right now. Her physician's office is closed. She cannot get a virtual injection done. You just got to do it. And I did it. And since then, she's been coming back to me every single month. So a lot of things has changed. The scope has changed a whole lot over the last couple of months. And pharmacists are just um, taking the charge and just leading the way. I, I had the privilege of actually um, facilitating an e-course with University of Alberta this fall. Uh, the course is called InterD403, and it's actually a course that focuses on interprofessional collaboration. Um, there was over a thousand healthcare professionals, students in their first year that were enrolled in the course because it's a mandatory course at the University of Alberta. So all healthcare professional students, whether it be medical, dental, pharmacy, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, right across the board, everybody has to do the course. And so this year it was done online. So it was considered an e-course with a asynchronous um, portion and a synchronous portion. And I was able to participate in both portions. I was one of the 46... Um, facilitators that assisted with the course and of the 46 facilitators that assisted with the course I'm proud to say that 80% of them were actually pharmacists so of the 46 healthcare professionals who helped to facilitate interd 403 80% were pharmacists and then when I looked at the numbers for the 146 peer coaches who helped to facilitate the course and a peer coach basically is a third or final year um, students in their course, of the 146 of them, 70% of them were actually pharmacy students. So it was actually, it made me feel very happy to see that pharmacists were actually putting themselves out there in terms of helping healthcare professionals to try to work together more collaboratively. Um, I would implore anybody who is on this um, Zoom meeting, um, if they have the time, to try and find an article that was written by Leslie Bainbridge and Glenn Rieger, and it's about should there be an IN team? And it was looking at a new perspective on developing and maintaining collaborative networks in health um, professional care. This article actually 
speaks a whole lot about how much we can achieve and how much we can accomplish if we work together a little bit more um, collaboratively. If we stop, I mean, like looking at social capital from like a, a hierarchy perspective where like some people are higher than others and um, some people should just stay where they are. If we all just look at our individual roles, see how we contribute um, to the whole healthcare team, whether it's in an institutional setting or it's in a retail setting, there is always some form of collaboration going on. I actually work in an outpatient um, pharmacy setting and I do a whole lot of collaboration with different specialists, um, rheumatologists, um, physiotherapists, dietitians, cardiologists, you name it. If I have an issue, I send a fax to them. If I do a prescribing, I have to notify them that I've prescribed and why I've prescribed and notify them that the patient is going to follow up with them. So there's a whole lot of collaboration going on, but not everybody is receptive to collaboration. Sometimes I'll send a fax to say, hey, I initiated this prescription and a physician will fax back to say, hey, thank you. I'll take the care from here. Sometimes nothing comes back. And when I follow up with the patient, they're like, oh yeah, I did have a call with the physician and we're going to be continuing with the medication. So some people are used to collaborating while others are not, but pharmacists are taking charge um, in terms of leading um, the collaborative process. And especially now with COVID-19 pandemic, where we're located, a lot of the offices are closed, like the physician's offices are closed. Um, physicians now have the option of doing virtual consults. So a lot of people are relying on virtual consults. But when there is something to be done, like say, for example, a B12 injection in a patient who is on chemotherapy, um, that can't be done virtually. So they're coming to the pharmacies um, because pharmacy doors are always open as long as the opening hours are posted. We're always open for the opening hours. We're never closed. I mean, when the pandemic just started, some pharmacies had decided to stop offering um, injection services uh, just because of the fear and everything and the unknown. But my pharmacy didn't. We, we plundered through. Uh, we got the necessary PPEs that were required. Um, I actually work with a chain and they were very supportive of, you know, getting everything together. Uh, we were actually one of the first groups to participate in the testing for COVID-19. We, we were actually doing asymptomatic COVID-19 COVID testing, testing up to about maybe like a month ago when they discontinued the program just to focus on the upcoming flu season and to take a little bit of pressure off of us because we're doing a lot of flu shots currently. Um, currently, I have done maybe in excess of a thousand flu shots by myself, and I do work with maybe like three other pharmacists in my practice setting. So we are actually doing a whole lot as pharmacists. And I, I just want to say that it, governments are now increasingly recognizing pharmacists and valuing um, what we take to the table in terms of our role. And because they're saying, seeing um, that healthcare is becoming more sustainable. Um, because of what we're able to offer and because of our willingness to take the baton and to lead and to run with it. Um, lastly, I'd just like to say Quebec was the last province to actually allow their pharmacists to administer vaccines. And that didn't happen until the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Prior to that, vaccines were offered in pharmacies in Quebec, but they're only offered by nurses. And then COVID-19 came. 2,600 pharmacists were trained in administering injections. And right now, all their pharmacists are doing their flu shots. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, Shami. Um, I don't know if you remember, I'm, I'm Dr. Winston Christie, past president of UPA. We made first contact when we started the Genadian Book Grant. Hi, um, Dr. Christie. Hi. I want to commend, the, commend you on the presentation. Very inspiring and exciting territory for us. But I'd like you to put in the chat or repeat the reference that you gave us to check out. Okay, I'm going to put it in the chat. I'll, I'll um, mention it again, but I'll put it in the chat as well. It's called Should There Be an I in Teams? A New Perspective on Developing and Maintaining Collaborative Networks in the Health professional care and it was published by Nova Science Publishers um, New York and it's chapters four um, page 51 to 66 but I'll put it in the chat thank you you're welcome any other questions 
Hi Shamika, good evening. This is Leone Wallace. Congratulations on all the wonderful trailblazing work you're doing. Thank you. Just want to find out, I remember um, a few years ago, there were some pharmacists from Canada who gave a presentation at CAP on de-prescribing. Are you involved in that in any way? Yes, Leone, I am. I am heavily involved in de-prescribing. <laughs> we have, well, there are still some physicians who actually like to do the shopping list of prescriptions where they will prescribe one drug for every single thing that they've encountered when in truth and in fact um you can use one drug to cover like three or four of the different conditions but they like prescribing one drug for each single condition so we're heavily involved in actually de-prescribing when i get a prescription in my pharmacy I am not allowed to just take the prescription and fill it as is. I have to do what is called an assessment on the prescription, and I have to use my professional judgment to decide if the prescription can be dispensed or not. So what we usually do is go through the prescription, because that's what the college wants. You need to do an assessment on the prescription. You look at what is prescribed. You ask the patient some questions just to make sure that what is being prescribed is appropriate. So you need to make sure it's appropriate and it's for the right patient. So if in my determination, I realize that this prescription is not appropriate, there are too many drugs on it, um, or it's not the most ideal product for the patient, based on what the patient's medical history is, based on what the patient lab results are showing, because that's another thing. We have the ability to pull the lab results using um, a very secure platform called Netcare. So I pull the patient's lab, I look at the lab results, I look at what is prescribed, I ask the patient a couple of questions, I go into the consult notes, um, I sort of get an idea of what the physician who is prescribing is saying. And then I decide, is this the most appropriate prescription for the patient? If the answer is yes, I'll dispense. If the answer is no, then I'll change the prescription because I do have the ability to change the prescription. When I change that prescription, I'll explain to the patient why I'm changing the prescription. Then I document why I have changed the prescription. And then I notify the prescriber that I have changed your prescription for X, Y, Z reason. So we do a lot of deep prescribing, especially for, for, for new starts on like benzodiazepines, especially for like over prescribing um, narcotics post-surgery they're not supposed to prescribe more than like a week's worth of narcotics um, post-surgery i've seen pain management specialists post-surgery prescribing five weeks worth of narcotics i only dispense a week i send them a note saying i've only dispensed a week of of the narcotics post-surgery because that is the current guidelines if you have any questions send me a fax give me a call 99% of the time, nobody calls, nobody fax. So it is what it is. Oh, really great. Another question. Um, did Leonie, you have to sorry, just one you moment, be Leonie, sorry, just one minute before you move on to your next question. I just wanted to add something real quickly to what Shamika said. Um, part of the reason why this prescribing is very common, especially in Alberta, is with the expanded scope of practice that we have here, it gives pharmacists a lot of leeway and a lot of a lot of ground in which that we can act independently. So even the act of de-prescribing is something that we are, I would say the profession has gone way ahead in other, way ahead of other provinces and way ahead of other places in the world. And it's partly because of our ability now to operate under what we call that additional prescribing authorization. So the fact that you can prescribe also means that you can also remove drugs from a patient therapy. So once you're a prescribing pharmacy, pharmacist here, it's seen as basically you have the authorization to do anything that the physician would be able to do, except for a few little, few areas where we're not allowed to prescribe narcotics, except now in COVID, we can extend certain prescriptions as it pertains to narcotics. But the fact that we have that additional prescribing authorization gives us the authority to start and stop therapy. So all of that falls under that scope of that expanded scope of practice that 
you now have in Alberta. So any pharmacist, usually it's not any pharmacist that you'll find prescribing drugs. It's usually the ones that have gone through the process of becoming additional prescribers and have gone through the process of actively seeking to expand their scope of practice. Okay. Well, I think you've partially answered the question I was going to ask. I wanted to know if you had to do like a certificate training or some, I know Shamika alluded to some training earlier, but what is the extent of the training that allows you to do all of that? And are there any legal implications or underpinnings? Because I, from the time I heard about the deep prescribing, I thought that was something that was very relevant to our society. But it sounded as if it required, you know, a lot more training. So I just wanted to know how much more training did you have to undergo? Okay, so and the legal implications. So there's always legal implications with everything, and that is why we stress a lot of um, documentation. You always have to document, document, document. Everything you do, you need to make sure that you have a rationale for doing it, and you have to make sure that you document it, right? So that is your legal, the legal framework that you stand on. How the laws are written, they are written having pharmacists as practitioners, and so it gives them um, that ability to prescribe. In terms of training, um, new graduates who are graduating with a PharmD can apply for additional prescribing authorization right after. Those who have a bachelor's degree um, usually have to wait a year. So you have to be practicing for a year first. And what usually happens is that you submit an application to your college. That, well, for us, it's the Alberta College of Pharmacists. And in that application, it's a comprehensive package. It's like a portfolio. It would be similar to somebody who wants to become an architect and apply into the, the um, School of Architecture and submitting an entire portfolio, which is reviewed by a committee. And then the committee makes a decision whether or not that student um, has achieved the minimum standard. So it's similar for us. You submit a portfolio um, where you answer, I think it's about 30 questions in terms of why um, you want to be able to prescribe uh, a whole lot of questions. What, what is your practice setting? Who do you have as supports? What kind of references do you have available at your disposal? Those kind of questions. Um, walking through the assessors, the whole process of how you would think, how you would do um, certain situations. And then you present, um, is it two or three cases, Dan? I think it's, it's, Two or three um, cases. So when you do it, it's three cases that three you cases. have to present and mm -hmm. you present the cases in such a manner that you have to show how you would do the diagnosis. So mm -hmm. when you present the information that is, pre and these have to be real life cases. It, yes. it's, it's a situation where you, uh, you take a situation where a patient has walked into the pharmacy and is now seeking your help and you have to walk the assessor through, okay, what were the questions presented to you? Um, what determination you got from what what did you determine was the 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 diagnosis from what the patient is saying to you what references did you use to back up your diagnosis and then what are the prescribing option options that you would have picked for that situation so you have to present three comprehensive cases of you looking at it as the prescriber oftentimes because it has to be real life in what you would have done in that situation is sent it off to a physician and gotten the physician's response but when you're presenting the case you have to present what the um the physician's response was plus you have to give your own um rationale of what you would have selected and how you'd have come to that selection so it's pretty much a case study an application supported by three case studies to show that you do have the requisite knowledge to be a prescriber then and oftentimes one of the most important things when you think about the legal framework of it is that they ask that you have to have your documentation as Shamika said but also make sure that you're practicing within a scope, scope that you are comfortable it's very important so while i can pick up the pen and i can write a, a prescription for an antidepressant or i can write a prescription for an antibiotic at the end of the day what is key for the college is that you are comfortable with that area of practice so for example i per se don't work in a retail setting anymore i work in a specialized setting where i deal with a very limited number of drugs 
number of drugs. So right now, whether or not I would feel, even though I have additional prescribing, I might not feel comfortable with a patient coming in to me and asking me for a prescription for something for diabetes, for example. So even though I'm a prescriber and I know I could just simply write the prescription, oftentimes I will step back and say, hey, I'm not comfortable writing a prescription for diabetes because legally I could not defend that in um, if something were to happen with the therapy, I couldn't go through the, the whatever rigors they would put me through to question my, my, my prescription. I wouldn't feel competent, competent in doing that. So when it comes to the legal portion, one of the things that the college pushes really hard is that whatever you write a prescription for, you have to feel that you are competent enough and understand the area enough to stand behind your decision. So if a doctor questions it, or if the patient has a side effect or has something go wrong with that therapy, you can legally, you can stand confidently in a court of law and say, yes, I back my prescription. This is why I back my prescription kind of a thing. So that's part of um, how, it, how it is here. Um, um, Leonie, just to, to touch on one thing also, um, when you're submitting that application, so all pharmacists in Alberta have the ability to adapt prescriptions. And I'll explain what adaptation is. And that is how you build your case studies out of adaptations. So essentially, all pharmacists in Alberta are allowed to extend prescriptions. So if a prescription is written and the patient is out of refills, the pharmacist can do an assessment and extend that prescription for a particular period of time. A pharmacist can also renew prescriptions. So if the prescription has expired and the pharmacist finds that the therapy is still warranted and the patient still requires the therapy, the pharmacist can actually renew that prescription. So, um, so in adapting prescriptions, whether by extension or by renewal, right. that is where pay persons get the opportunity to build their cases for submission to the college. Um, Shamika. Hello. Vivian Watson here. Hi, Mrs. Watson. How are you? I am good. How are you? Fine, thank you, sweetheart. Um, I will just want to share your practice. Congratulations to the UTEC alumni. We seem to do so well when we go abroad. Um, and I just wanted to share that my sister, who is an alumni, she's actually now an independent prescriber in the UK. So your practices seem to shadow, well, not shadow, but you know, your practices seem to be very similar. Yes, it's, it's very similar because that's what we are. When we have additional prescribing authorization, um, we are independent prescribers. Yeah. yeah. So you can prescribe without any sort of input by anybody. Yes. Yeah. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, time. what can I say, Shamiko? We're so happy. And Deanry, yeah. you were able to share with us this afternoon and we've kind of gone over the timeline. We promised you one hour inside here. We're really trying to get out in one hour. But it has been pretty interesting. And, you know, I'm looking at the number of participants here and I'm like, wow, uh, COVID has really helped us because I think this is maybe one of our better at, um, attendance we're having here this afternoon. And the, in, the interaction is really wonderful. And we have lots more to learn, I can say, and lots more to share. And we have to think about getting you to come back with us some other time. But we really appreciate you on. Um, Dr. Grizzle, can you give me a little bit of sharing rights right now? I just wanted to show. I have a picture someplace of these Janadians, and I wanted to put it up. You can share. It's open. Okay. All right. As let's long as and, and, uh, I think Shakila came. I think I saw her. Okay. All right, so this is, I think, the, where am I? I'm coming. Okay, so this, I have a set of six photographs here, which I was told was the first set of six pharmacists who started. Am I right, Shamiko? So just that, yes, you know, you're correct. See. We, we right. had one additional person join this year, um, Judy Ann Blair. I don't think we have a picture of her. She joined this year because we had... Right. This had was results. what I got from you last year. Correct. I just wanted to give our participants an idea of... Okay. I'll stop sharing. Back to you now, Dr. Grizzle. I'm right. just saying that Shakila from the Palm Tech program, I think she's here. You can ask. 
Is Shaquille on? Student. Pharmaceutical technology student, are you on Shaquille? Doesn't look so. All right. Okay. All right. All right. So we will run ahead because that is said we're running a little behind time right now. And um, we're just going to spend a little time. Most of you have been on our platform before. Know that we have a great working relationship um, with UTEC. We, we exist, really, to support the programs at UTEC. And therefore, we just wanted to speak about some of the things that have happened recently. We know that we have been, those of us who have been around know about our um, repair of the classroom over the years and the beginning of our endowment fund. But this year we continued with our donations to UTEC with the facilitation of um, our scholarships and awards the collaboration and I want to point out to some of our um, those who are on the the platform right now who don't know that while we have to facilitate the awards from time to time we are not involved so we don't participate as members of the awards committee we don't get involved in the selection of persons because it came up in a situation some time ago, and I just wanted to make that clear that the UTEC Pharmacy Alumni does not really participate in that part of the program. 2020 has been, as we said, a, a very strange year, but the needs continue to be there, and therefore we continue to respond. This year, the U, uh, Pharmaceutical Society of Jamaica had promised from last year that they would donate all their monies from the 5K last year, and they did provide $300,000 to the UPA to assist UTEC. And therefore, earlier this month, I think it was about the 1st of, 1st, 2nd of November, that uh, UPA, along with SIPAR, was able to contribute $650,000 to the School of Pharmacy, College of Health Sciences. And we want to give those who made it possible a round of applause if you can't clap, you can at least send. I don't know how to use all of these chat features yet, but we just give thanks. And also of note this year, we had a situation where there were some students who uh, might not have graduated because they had outstanding fees. And these were not pharmacy students. These were pharmaceutical technology, bachelor of pharmaceutical technology students. And there was an alum that came to the rescue through I can contact with UPA and was able to provide $13,667.38, so precise, US, that is. And this alum's name is Winston Clark. And we just like to acknowledge his contribution. I hear he doesn't particularly like to be noticed and to be uh, recognized publicly but we have to thank him for his contribution to the well-being of our students as, as an alum as well. So these are some of the things that have ha continued to happen this year despite our challenges. And um, on the form, the fly today, I think you have seen the bank account that you can contribute to the programs that SIPAR, UTEC, UPA does for the School of Pharmacy. That's just a little bit about that for today. Miss Smith, Miss Smith, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, this is Janet Shelley. Um, oh, Dr. Shelley, you're on. I didn't notice you. Welcome, <laughs> welcome. Yes. And yes, I was looking. Thank you. Thank you. I am not really on the program to speak, but you having said that, I think I really have to say something because um, on behalf of the College of Health Sciences, I can't let the opportunity pass without expressing to to um the UPA SIPAR, the Alumni Association, the the gratitude that we feel for the contributions that have been made, especially this year. You outlined the two incidences and I wouldn't go back over them, but it was really, really appreciated 
unexpected in some ways, but appreciated by the recipient. And so I really want to use the opportunity to say how grateful the students were and how appreciative the college is of the contribution that is being made by the association. So thank you very, very much and um, continue to, to give back. It's always so good having received that we are seeking opportunities to give back. So thanks a million for all that the associations are doing. Over. Thank you, Dr. Shelley. I guess you came in a bit late because I was trying to recognize all these wonderful people that we continue to work with at UTEC. And, you know, as I say, we, 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 we exist really for the school and for the, the students who pass through. Because I love to tell people the role of the alumni is very different from the role of a professional body. We are there to provide financial support for pharmacy students in need of support to promote programs and activities of the School of Pharmacy and fundraising events for the School of Pharmacy and to encourage pharmacy graduates to donate and contribute. And we will continue to do that because that is really our mandate and we see the fruits of our labor when we do that from time to time. And we thank our partners. Um, early on, I mentioned Dr. Uh, Ernestine. I think she was off at the time. I'm seeing her back on now. Welcome, Dr. Ernestine. I see Dr. Brown at some point there as well. And um, we didn't have, Dr. Shelley, we didn't have many people on the program this time because we really were trying to get it done in one hour. It seems as if the one hour is running away from us right now. But so um, we're going to make it in the hour at because the real presentation of the lecture has not started yet. And don't yeah, stop it if you can do that in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, it's nothing beats a shy but a failure. So, sorry, we are here this afternoon as is usual, to remember the contribution of Dr. E. Grace Allen Young. And this afternoon, we will not spend time speaking about her because I dare to say those on the platform who don't know Dr. Grace Allen Young maybe ought to do some research because it's a name in Jamaica. If you're anything to do with pharmacy, you ought to know that name. You ought to know who she is, was, and what she means to the profession. Uh, just basically to remind us all that she was she was a trailblazer. She was a president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Jamaica. She was president of the Pharm uh, Caribbean Association of Pharmacy. She was, and I guess still is, the only female vice um, president of the Commonwealth Pharmacy Association. So she has, and she became the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health Jamaica, the only pharmacist to have done that. So we know her worth and what she stood for and her leadership over the years. And to speak with us this afternoon is no other than Dr. Ellen Gamble Grizzle, who again we all know, and the person I still refer to as a person who does not sleep. But even as Dr. Grizzle gets on in age, you think she'd slow down. I don't know if she understands that concept of slowing down. And since we have very little time, we'll just go right ahead and ask Dr. Grizzle to take it away from us and give us. I am, I'm going to ask Shakila. She joined the student just to say something the one who benefited from Mr. Clark's generosity. Are you on, Shakila? Yes, I'm here, Ms. Grizzle. Hello, everyone. <laughs> we want to say a few words. <laughs> All right. Sorry for joining in late. All right, so I am one of the students that benefited from the generosity of Mr. Winston Clark. So. It was me in addition to two other students, so I'll just speak on behalf of all three of us. So we were going through, a, you know, our little rough time, graduation, and we're trying to register. So, you know, everybody can take their pictures, have a merry day, you know, say final goodbyes to UTEC and go about our business just to find out that we can't register because we owe the school money. Um... Not sure if I should give a little background as to why, but I think I'm going to leave that out. No. Um, we were going through a tough time because the university is now saying that we need to find that sum of money that we owe in a span of less than a week in order to register so that we can take our pictures and be present for the graduation. We reached out to Mrs. Harris Kidd, who is our first director, and I must commend that she was working tirelessly behind the scenes in order to help us. 
um, because at this point it became a situation where it was more than us. We're in a pandemic and it's kind of hard financially at the moment just to say that we have to find that huge sum of money in order to receive my degree. So I was going through, well, me personally was going through a tough time. I was depressed in a sense. Four years of school and you're going to tell me that I might, might not have anything to show. So it was a rough time for me. Um, Mrs. Harris reached out saying that she spoke with Dr. Shelley and an alumni of the university was willing to sponsor us. So when we heard that, we were really ecstatic. We were overjoyed because we we're saying, yes, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. God answered our prayers. Somebody came through for us in our time of need. We were really ecstatic. So for me personally, Dr. Um, Mr. Winston Clark, he was basically my knight in shining armor. So he came to my rescue and I needed it the most at that time. I didn't know what would happen because as I was in a dark place. I was trying to think positive, but you know, mentally and your whole emotional and it was just in that space. So when I heard that Dr. Mr. Clark was going to be that person to step in to provide and to help us in our time of need, I was really overjoyed and really great. Um, I want to express my thanks on behalf of myself and the other two students names Ajay Houghton and Roxanne Kennedy. We really want to express our thanks for you just stepping in and and, in and you know helping us just to move forward with our lives basically because that was just a block that was hindering us from progressing because without our degrees we probably cannot do a suitable, a suitable work you know. So Mr. Clark, I'm not I was looking through the list of attendees, but I don't think I'm seeing Mr. Clark's name anywhere. He was Mr. Clark, are you He's not here? I don't think so. Oh, okay. All right, I'll just give him another call and mm -hmm. express my thanks. So yes, um, that's what he did for us. And all he wanted in return from us was just to give back. And that's what we will do because we've benefited from someone who's willing to give. And he just basically imprinted on my life at this moment. So it's imperative right now. I want to reach at that stage where I'm able to give back to someone who they need. So thanks again to Mr. Clark. Thanks, Shakila. I thought that was... I thought that was important. Can I ask everybody else to mute their phones? Thank you. Somebody is not listening to you. Kaden McLean. The host of the meeting can mute everybody. Yes, I'm trying to. Dr. Visa. I'm trying to. Thanks. Dr. Visa, think... before you go, ahead, I think I just saw Elaine Foster Allen on. Okay. I'd like to welcome her to this forum. She's a relative of Dr. Allen Young, I know. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. Pleasant evening. Um, I'm Ellen Grisco, and I'm going to ask everybody to mute. Um, while I present, it's kind of challenging to, to hear all the feedback. So I'm asking everybody to mute. Thank you. Mrs. Grissel, as the host, can you mute everybody? I can mute. I can do that. But Mrs. Grissel? I am doing it alone, but one by one, and that's the challenge. Wherever it comes up, I do. But I think 
Everybody has got the message. If you can pick up Kitty and McLean, because that has been the one that is outstandingly out all um, open for long. Okay, that's done now. She's closed now. All right, so good evening, everybody. And welcome to this um, Grace Allen Young Memorial Lecture for 2020. And we have heard and shared all the good things that your alumni has done um, in memory of our dear friend and mentor, Dr. Grace Allen Young. Um, I am going to do a, a presentation on, on, on leadership and really focusing on the, on the years 1962 to 1992 and what kind of leadership we have experienced in that period or based on historical documents and theoretical framing and so on. And pose a question at the end, where are we now? What is the vision for pharmacy at this, at, in today's world? What is our vision? And a couple of other questions that I hope will motivate some thought for leadership of the Pharmaceutical Society of Jamaica and maybe the University of Technology, those who lead pharmacy. So that's a picture of Dr. Grace Allen Young. And I just want to, to welcome her family, those who have joined us. Um, and to say that we are using the virtual but this evening, but we are still, the spirit is there and we are still honoring Grace for the contribution that she made to our profession. Real lady of substance and real, real con strategic contributor to, the, to, to what we are enjoying today as pharmacists. And Alicia told you about her. She was a lady of many firsts, including to become a pharmacist, to become a permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health. Importantly for some of you who are continuing to benefit and forget the helicopter overhead. She led the first part of the team that led the fight for a Bachelor of Pharmacy degree at UTEC. And that itself is another story that has to be written as to how that came about. But those of you who are in Canada and elsewhere, and we thank you for giving back. But though a lot of that was made possible because you have a, a bachelor's degree as a basic qualification. And that was achieved after nearly 20 years of advocacy um, to be offered during the, to the, through the University of Technology. And Grace also was one of the founding members of SPAR and the UP. So my topic, yeah. my topic is perspectives on 30 years Hello. of pharmacy leadership in Jamaica. 1962 to 1992. And I have there the symbol of the bowl of Hygia. She was, it, it, this is a symbol that's used in Europe for pharmacy. And I mean, has been, was developed, the, I was used from the 16th century. It's even older than the, the um, mortar and pestle. And I want to give us a sense that although I'm talking about 1962, 1992, pharmacy is a very old profession. It's not today. <laughs> uh, it's a profession with um, long tradition and history and a long, really, con history of contribution to, to society. So there is um, Hygieia. She was the daughter of the god of medicine, Asclepius, and her sisters were Panacea, goddess of universal remedy. And she also had a sister named Accesso, who was goddess of the healing process. And another sister called Egel, goddess of beauty and splendor. So we set ourselves as a very old profession, but we have a vision of a profession that is constantly changing moored in our core values, because that really is what holds us together as pharmacists, but really responsive and re not re re reactive so much as proactive, seeing beyond the current times to where we want to be, um, where we want to go. And recognizing that in that vision, there are cultural issues, there are the context is, is local, very much how can we serve our society in the best way that we can. So while we take from our Canadian colleagues what they're doing, we need now to put that in our current context to see what is feasible, what is good for Jamaica, so that we don't adapt without interrogation and consideration. So I'm gonna talk about some aspects of theory and thinking around leadership, and that's copious. 
that Scopius, the importance of followership, readiness to the creation of a learning organization. I'm going to present some examples of pharmacy leadership in Jamaica and associated leadership tools that were used and finally present the pharmacy assets built up between 1962 and 1992. And I will try to do so as crisply as possible. The question begins and the discussion begins as to what is leadership. And I have the three different takes on it. Um, I think the one I like is are people who have the ability to persuade and motivate others towards achieving a common goal. Their first responsibility is to define reality for the followership. And that's from the fifth discipline, but those of you have read Peter, Peter Senge, that is actually his take on leaders and who they are. The other say, um, success, success, successful leaders help their organization develop a common system view that builds appreciation for the big picture. They bridge a the gap between people and possibilities. Then that comes from the art of engagement written by Holden. So there are very various people who have spoken on leadership, defined leadership, and some are, and we have seen a progression in the definition of leadership. My own perspective, of course, that there is there cannot really be leadership without an engaged followership. You can't, there, there's no point in leading by yourself if there's nobody going to follow you. So there must be an act of persuasion that engages the followership so that they are willing to work towards a common goal. And this is a challenge. This is what we call systems thinking, where you know you see the big picture, and the leaders must be able to draw to draw you to, to take you towards a big picture. This element is often used with a number of people feeling parts of it and saying, "Oh, this is a snake. This is a tree. This is a wall. This is a rope." It's a fan, it's a spear, but because they're not seeing the big picture, they don't recognize that it's an elephant. So that is the kind of silos that we put ourselves in. And so we cannot see the big picture. And what happens sometimes in leadership is that we have to bridge the canyons that develop when we fall into our own little silos. Maybe we have professional expertise or whatever. So we are into silos and we don't recognize that it's one big picture and it's called pharmacy. It's a big, big, big picture. There's some thinking that good leaders have to be able to create jet creative tension, that sort of tension that achieves change and movement. And Martin Luther King spoke about this tension that it can help people to rise from the bondage of myths and, and half-truths so that we can create the kind of society that will help men rise from dark depths of prejudice and racism through the creation of this creative tension. And of course, King was actually speaking of the personal mastery and courage of leaders to hold up a vision before members and tell them the truth about their current reality in relation to the vision that they have, they are putting before them as a, as a, as a, as a, as a as a goal that they, 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 they are to reach. And here's a, another example from Howden in the, the book, the author of the book, Art of Engagement, 2018. He tells, often tells the story of three bricklayers. So each one picks up a brick and sets it in a place. The first bricklayer says, I'm putting one brick on top of the other. The second says, I'm building the west wall of a church. And the third says, I'm creating a cathedral. It will stand for centuries and inspire people to do great deeds. That's just the, the difference in terms of the, the breadth and scope of vision, that you are doing something for eternity. And I know that the Chinese think in centuries, some, and, and so it, it behoves us to start thinking, just as how the people who actually, um, the people who actually did the planning for pharmacy, that we could have a place to stay, 41 Lady Muscle Road, that we would have degrees and all of that. They were thinking about it from years up, um, behind because they were thinking about eternity and those, they would live to see it, but they wanted it to happen. 
And so too must we think. And there are about myths about leadership. Leaders are born, not made. Um, I have seen enough evidence to understand that, that leadership can be learned, it can be taught, um, that you need to be charismatic and visionary to be a leader for success. The evidence, according to Collins in his books, is, is that in fact, the successful leaders are hardworking, diligent, persistent people who may not have the grand the charismatic person, um, personalities, but they'll put one foot for the other, rise, be resilient, and rise, rise up and succeed and can lead people to, to success. You don't need external leaders to shape an uh, uh, organization. A good leader can come from the same organization, but they must have the kind of scope of, of vision to understand that what the it, it, uh, organization that they're in stands for is not the totality of what exists. So they must have exposure to outside to bring that into the inside and shake up an organization. And they must have the courage to do it because we get into a kind of mutual thinking, group think, and so everybody thinks the same way. Nobody wants to challenge what is happening. So you end up with groups of people and little, little cults like um, forming a block within an organization and the leader may emerge from one block and not the other. And then you, you have the continuation of, 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 I call it just destruction because one part, one block can be leading a total organization. The only constant is change sometimes, no. Um, sometimes change is not desirable. Not all change is desirable. And I think sometimes we, 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 can, make, we can be flexible but we must always have our eye fixed and anchored on our core values to make sure that our core values are appropriate. And so we embrace that change as long as it is in, in fit, befitting of our core values and it, of, of focus on serving people rather than ourselves. So as long as that change is in keeping with that, then, and we have interrogated it and it's fine and we can do service within that context, and we're not selling our immortal souls, then of course change is a very, very, is something to be welcome. And again, organizations don't need the brightest among us and highly qualified leaders to succeed. I know some people are academically brilliant, but they're not necessarily the best people to lead an organization. And we have to understand that. You know, it could be just somebody who's willing to plod and plod and plod, and they are empathetic because they understand the problems of the broad mass of pharmacists who are at the B farm level and who are trying to identify a way to, to practice at a higher level. And how can I get them to move forward on that? And I speak about Grace, not that Grace, Grace was not brilliant because she was. Many people when we were diploma pharmacists would speak of the fact that they would like for a degree to happen. And I think it was a nice thing to say, so people said it. But my, both Mitch Nelson and myself, when we came together as pharmacists in the pharmacy council, recognized that those of us who had the diploma had to be the persons to do it ourselves because we wanted that degree to open doors for the rest of us. And we found an ally in Dr. Allen Young who already had had her bachelor's from the UK. But she also saw that the kind of elitism that was being bred at the time, where if you had a degree, you were kind of superior to those who had a diploma. She felt that that was completely, um, you know, not right and worked with us to make sure that we even the odds for those people who had a diploma. And it was not an easy thing to do. So it's a leadership fact that leadership is learned because leaders are not born with special powers. They were made over time through challenges, personal courage, setbacks, self-reflection, and an ability to grow. So the art and science of leadership is learned. Talk a little bit about organizational culture because as a leader, that is so, so very important. And that is really linked to our code values and sometimes codified to some extent in our code of ethics. We do have a code of ethics um, for the um, pharmacy in Jamaica. Um, and so it's, and that code of ethics sometimes pulls in 
some historical professional practice, scientific learning, and so on. Norms, social societal norms too, are, are, are part of, of what comes together under our code of ethics. And it be, I teach that code of ethics to our pharmacy students now, um, as it speaks to the, the role of the pharmacist. Although it, I think the code of ethics that we are teaching now, it was reviewed in 1992, and that was over 20 odd years ago. So it's time for now for the PSG to look at um, actually revising the code of ethics of the organization. But we teach it because it still has some relevant values and so on. And then there are cross cultural winds, cross cultural winds that can shift your cultural beliefs, particularly in the era of globalization, which we are in now, when cultural truisms can be confronted by cultural practices in dominant and powerful states. And so leaders, and many of our leaders in pharmacy today have received their graduate program, or graduate education from UK, US. And so, and I'm, I'm now quoting Paul Miller, cultures of educational leadership, not necessarily pharmacy. And so we have to make sure that what is being put to us as something we should follow is quite relevant to the, the Jamaican society in which we live. And in keeping with things that all people will value. And so we have to be very, very careful as to how we adapt and try to institute <coughs> changes. And in this cultural cross current, we are often consumers of knowledge. And I believe that as Caribbean pharmacists know, we must also become our unique value is as producers of knowledge. And that is the work that we have to do now with all our highly qualified academics who can do research and teach and do a number of things. We must push now to be the producers of pharmaceutical knowledge. And then we must seek to have our organization and our principal organization in terms of the profession is a PSJ, Pharmaceutical Society of Jamaica established in 1928. So we need a learning organization in which all our followership is engaged and that we can set up structures to ensure that we become a learning organization that can recognize, interrogate, and adapt to change as required. And we, as learning organizations based on the theory, you're not really driven by the past. You're actually motivated by a future vision. So you're not so driven by this, this, the external shift that may not be, a, not be perceived by internal stakeholders to be, to be to be relevant, because in that case, the changes will be resisted. But if you have a vision that people buy into, your membership buys into, and it is led in a kind of structured way by achieving set milestones to the future that we want to create. Because change is not, is not inspired from what we were in the past, or what, or what Compet competitors or, or similar entities are doing. Change is really inspired by what we want to be um, in, in, in the future, what we want to become in the future. So then why am I framing this lecture in the past? Well, we need to know what we did in the past and what was achieved and what didn't work. We need to know what elements contributed to our organizational culture if we want to change that or, or, or tweak that culture. We want to understand the context, bent and attributes of leadership and state of followership at the time when, when, when decisions were made. And ultimately we want to synthesize this information collectively and develop a future vision of the profession of pharmacy that we can achieve over the long term. So its history is important, but what we really want to do is to reimagine our future and work towards achieving that future based on the knowledge of the past. So it's like a, a, a true line, a, a continuum. And there, there's consensus about what are some powerful leadership traits. Although I happen to believe that everybody is a leader in their own right, but the authorities tell us that honesty and integrity, confidence, inspir inspiring of others, commitment and passion, good communication, accountability, decision-making capabilities, 
delegation and empowerment, the ability to allow others to, once you give them um, their, their direction, that they will get the job done so you don't try to do everything yourself. Empathy, resilience, bouncing back, emotional intelligence, being able to walk in other people's shoes, humility, which is something Grace I know in my own case, when she and Aline would say to me, Ellie, I know that you are a gifted leader, but you need to be humble, <laughs> you know? So that one resonates with me quite well. And I had to learn that. Transparency, vision and purpose, creativity and innovations. These are about 15 traits that have been singled out. And some leaders have, not, I don't think every leader has all of them, but certainly some have a good mix of them. And as we look at the history in, of, of our um, profession in Jamaica between 62 and 92, we can see that some of the leaders indeed typified some of these, these leadership traits. And that is what uh, helped us to achieve some of the goals that we achieved. So let us talk about some of the past. And I know when we talk history, and I teach history at UTEC to the first year students, their eyes kind of glaze over. Um, and they, 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 um, they're really not interested to the extent that I wish and hope that they would be, but never mind. Um, so let me take some of the things that happened and the vision that surrounded them. We wanted to create then I, you know, a legislative framework in which pharmacists were independent providers of medicines. That is something that drove that generation of pharmacists, that drove the actual development of what is called the Pharmacy Act of 1966 to its conclusion to the pharmacy regulations of 1975. They literally were driven by the desire to ensure that pharmacists were independent. Now we hear that in Canada, our pharmacists are actually independent prescribers. They just wanted us at the time to be independent persons who could provide medicines to the country without having to have a doctor countersign whatever it is that they were doing. And, and they wanted to conclude a chapter in pharmacy where pharmacy was a stepping stone to medicine. It didn't become pharmacy as a professional end. You are on your way to medicine. And there's a big argument within the PSG as to those who felt it was to be a stepping stone and those who felt it should be a terminal profession. We, thank God, don't have those, those um, issues. We don't decide that pharmacy is going to be a profession and, and, and it's not a stepping stone. And there's enough in it to keep us um, um, providing service for a lifetime. And the names that come to me then are George Curry, who actually was the kind of secretary to the, 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 the committee preparatory to the establishment of the Pharmacy Act. Mr. Canil Beard, who headed the Drugs and Poisons Board that preceded the Pharmacy Act. We had Jeff Thompson, who was the kind of man, his wife worked at the, at, in, 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 um, down at uh, Gone House. And so he, with that contact, he actually helped push the Pharmacy Act through the, through the, um, through the different stages. There was Baba Vaughan, who was also a champion in terms of the, the business about terminal profession to stepping stone. And there was, of course, Mr. Lester Ullery, who really was a technocrat who seized the opportunity of an oncoming international health meeting um, in Jamaica in 1966 to give the minister something to announce at that international meeting and push the Pharmacy Act to make sure it was ready for that meeting. So that was, El minister, um, it was Dr. Eldemeyer at the time who was the Minister of Health. So Mr. Woolery was a kind of a strategist in trying to make sure. And the law pharmacists had to give up some things in order to get that act through. At the time, the practice was like the pharmacists could freely dispense any medication because there was no law. Um, they would do it in a kind of undercover fashion because they were operating under the, under the, the, the doctor's supervision, quote unquote. They had to give up that practice. In, in, in return for having a list of medicines that they could prescribe, some that had to be, well, they could initiate and some that could be prescribed by a physician. So there's a lot of, you know, negotiation because, you know, in Jamaica, um, those of us who understand that 
doctors literally have to give the green light for any legislation related to health to go through. And the way that that was negotiated had a lot to do with Mr. Woolery and his, his understanding of the civil service and so forth. In terms of pharmacy education, and uh, you know, to make sure that we were taught in an independent um, institution, like at the time, like the College of Arts, Science and Technology, and this occurred in 1962, Vernon Robinson was really, really one of the stalwarts of that. He was determined that we'd take pharmacy education out of KPH and into a college or school where we're being taught in terms of the science and, and all of that. He really was about making sure that pharmacists were taken out of the KPH thing and moved into an academic <laughs> And UWI was not interested in the time in, in the program. They, they were focusing on medicine. So they didn't want pharmacy. But Dr. Sangster, Dr. Alfred Sangster, and Dr. Henry Lowe, who was then in charge of the health sciences at, 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 at CAS, wanted the program. Because it was just in 1962 when CAS was just finding its way as a place to train new people for the new Jamaica in 1962. And they pushed for it. And for that, Dr. Henry Lowe received an award for the PhD as an honorary member, honorary life member which he still refers to today, because it was really related to the fact that he pushed to make sure that the program entered on um, cast. Mr. Vernon Robinson worked very hard to make sure that the levels of compensation and conditional work for pharmacists was improved. In the end, he failed. He worked very hard, but in the end, the pharmacists decided that they were going to join a union, because at the time, the PSJ was actually a union. And so they lost their rights to negotiate for some members of the public sector pharmacists. Um, so that didn't go so well. Although under Ms. Valerie Germain, who became president in the, in the 2000s, um, she returned the, the, the PSG again became a union under her watch. And there were some who wanted to make sure that we had a permanent home, 41 Lady Musgrave Road. Many mortgage their own personal premises to make sure we could pay down on the place. It was Mr. Granville Forbes who found the place and people like F.R. Henry, Dickie Kincaid, Edmund Sutherland and many others too, I, some of the names I don't have, who actually made sure that we could pay down on the place and get a mortgage for it. And Dr. Dr. Diane Robertson became one of the leaders now who made sure that we could pay off the mortgage, if you understand what I'm saying. So again, you had people stepping up to provide leadership for important, important um, goals that pharmacists wanted between 1962 and 1975. They showed vision and purpose. They were empathetic, honesty and integrity, resilience, good communication. They were able to inspire others because we as students were, were actually raising money later on to make all contribution to the mortgage. Um, of, of for 41 Lady Musgrave Road. And of course, their commitment and passion was boundless. And what happens as a, as a result of the, their commitment and passion was infectious. And so people became quite engaged in making sure that the PSJ had a home, etc., etc. that we got a degree. All of that came through that kind of compassion, that commitment and engagement. So then, between 75 and 92, and I'm just picking out some of these, this vision, they wanted to pay off the mortgage at, 40, at 41 Lady Musgrave. We actually paid it off in 1995. But the people in, engaged with that was, that I can recall because there may be others. Just F.R. Henry, we used to call him Fundraising Henry. Mr. Mahoney, Dr. Dan Roberts, <laughs> C. Ellen Gray, Grace Allen Young, Henry Harris. Henry is more of my contemporary but he was president before 1992. And of course, our CAPS, because we were students, we were in CAPS, and then there was Edmund Sutherland. Mr. Sutherland was the one who finally discharged the mortgage on 41 Lady Square Road. PSJ organizational structures. You had Keith Golden, you had Mr. Robinson, you had Grace Allen Young, you had C. Allen Gray. They wanted to make sure that the, but the foundation was strong so they've talked about branches, um, Western branch, Eastern branch, and so on. Branches, structure, members were engaged. 
and, 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 and then everything feeding into the pharmaceutical society of Jamaica. So they could, be, they could know what's happening on the ground in the different parishes and so forth. The Student Association at UTEC Jamaica was, uh, was really fostered by Vernon Robinson. He loved young people. I, I benefited from that too. He loved to see the young people coming in and that they would train them from the student organization and become members of the PSJ and ultimately leaders within the PSJ. Dr. Young, Grace Allen Young championed that. And the bachelor's degree in pharmacy, I've singled it out because there are those of us who consider it one of the greatest policy changes in the history of pharmacy in Jamaica, that bachelor's of pharmacy degree, because it opened the door for so many of our people who had a diploma to move on and to move up and to become international pharmacists and make the kind of contributions I'm hearing from the Canadian pharmacists today. Without that foundation, it could not have happened. So we thank Mr. Forbes, Granville, Grace Allen Young, and Vernon Robbins for that. Again, there was an engaged followership because all of those things were things that the pharmacists in Jamaica wanted, so they were engaged. Again, vision and purpose, empathy, resilience, good communication, this the kind of skill to inspire others, commitment and passion, humility, creativity and innovation, delegation and empowerment is really what some of the, the leadership, um, I would say, attributes that that were, were um, on, on show at that point in time. So, the, so the, in, in looking at it and synth synthesizing what I've said, I come to three C's that are essential to the culture. It was complementarity. There are leaders that recognize I don't have the skills, but Tom Stroke has it. I will lead this, you will lead that. And it was not a threat. It was not a threat. It's like what we're doing now in the team approach in, in, um, in healthcare, where there are people with different strengths and they work together to get the best result. Nobody was really thought to be useless. There was a role for everybody from the older pharmacists who had done pharmacy on the KPH to the younger ones who were coming out of UTEC at the time as diplomas. I'm fighting to get a degree, but there was compliment. There was committee where people really what we're trying to kind of work together, work together to make, to, to work to a common goal. So that kind of committee, nobody was disrespectful of anybody because we recognized that people had a role. And that's what I entered pharmacy and so. And I saw collegiality really expressed because sometimes it did not really occur. There were little things that happened that were not entirely collegial. But for what it's worth, it was expressed as recognized that we are all pharmacists and we must respect one another and respect the profession of pharmacy. Pharmacy was the vision. Pharmacy was the goal. Building pharmacy was really what people were working towards. So as I come to an end, what are some of the assets that we achieved and built between that period? By 1992, we had actually finished paying off the property and at, in the Golden Triangle of St. Andrew. And now discussion is taking place in the PSG as to what, as to how to develop the property. And we pray that we will find a way to hold the title while we do this, because it does need to be um, developed. So we accept that we just want to do it in a way that doesn't um, exclude the pharmacists from, from being owners in, at some time to come. We have a recognized training program at UTEC. By 1992, we had that. We had moved from a two-year plus six months training to a three-year um, program plus one-year internship in keeping with international standards. And that was really um, facilitated by the Pharmacy Act. And out of, and out of the Pharmacy Act, too, we had developed the thing, the laws like the Food and Drugs Administration, where we created a permanent structure within the Ministry of Health in which pharmacists would lead in terms of regulation, registration and product, product registration and GMP and a number of other those things. Far thinking, far thinking ahead of, the, of 1962. Your school of pharmacy is actually headed by a registered pharmacist. Not so in many, many other places in the Caribbean. But ours is that a school, our school is headed by a registered pharmacist. 
And that is something that the Pharmacy Council has held to, that UTEC has, has, has followed. And we are quite happy to know that that is something that we have worked to achieve. And there in 92 was the active movement because Alan, Dr. Alan Young was offered a Bachelor of Health Science degree with a pharmacy specialization. And I remember saying, no, what we want is the purest, and I remember the word, a purest pharmacy degree. And how right she was to have stuck to our guns. And we finally achieved it in 1995. We have our pharmacy council led by the registered pharmacists and the majority held by the Pharmaceutical Society of Jamaica. People fought for that. When it was that um, um, Dr. Horace Chang, then in the Minister of State in the Ministry of Health, had named a doctor to chair the Pharmacy Council, the PSJ members and the council refused to sit. And without the majority, they couldn't have a meeting until it was changed. They fought for that. The graduates of the School of Pharmacy, well, making remarkable contribution, all over the world, we have graduates in, in all over the world making a contribution. Um, mm -hmm. the, the recognition of pharmacy as a valuable and independent health, healthcare profession. The creation of a culture within the profession where all can aspire to the high levels of professionalism. All of us, all of us, whether you are, whether you are, you, whatever your qualification, you are still able to aspire and to become a pharmacist and to make your contribution. And the final note I had there is that we saw the emergence of a, of a business class that, uh, which at the time, you know, in the 60s and so, pharmacy was run by the rich, rich moguls of Jamaica, the Matalon family and so on, who owned um, pharmacy in Crossroads, I can't remember, um, and a number of other people, and people like Dr. Dan Robertson, and many of those who came out wanting to do their own business, they actually used to buy together to make sure that they had stock to compete with these um, big moguls. In the end, pharmacy now has a lot of small people who own it. Some pharmacies are hanging on. It's kind of tragic to me that we, most of our pharmacies are not owned by pharmacists, but there you go. I don't know if it can be a vision or part of our next vision going forward that we begin to to take back ownership in terms of a business sense of the profession of pharmacy or if that has also gone through the window already. They do we respect the culture of pharmacy because these are questions I'm interrogating. Do we respect the culture of the pharmacy profession in Jamaica? Do we? Do we think it's something that's worthwhile? I heard uh, um, one of our Janadians giving thanks and, and kind of you know, saying that based on what they learned at UTEC, it is what laid the foundation for them to be where they are in Canada. Are we respectful of that? And do we want to give back to say our school of pharmacy to make sure that they can help others who may be in need? And to, to what extent do we value protect production of knowledge rather than the replication of knowledge derived by others? What are we doing that is novel? for the country of Jamaica that will ease, that will offer you know, care and, 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 and health care to the, to, the, to the Jamaican people. What are we doing? And that may be something that is replicated by others. And then to the PSJ, how are we going to engage our dissolution pharmacists who have lost, we have lost them as loyal members of the PSJ. What are we going to do to get them back, to stir them up, to create a kind of creative tension that they will have to come back to have a say in what is that we are going to do going forward. And finally, how can we bridge the canyons that have developed between various silos that we have created that constitute the profession of pharmacy in Jamaica? Which leader is going to bridge that gap? Who is going to emerge to bring the pieces together into a whole elephant? Who is going to be that leader? And do we have them among us with some of the traits that were embodied between the 1962 and 1992 period. So I'll share with you some of the receipts of, of, the, of the successes that we made and introduce it to some of the people who contributed at that time. We can learn much from the patterns of leadership that have, been work, that have worked for us in the past, but ultimately we need smart, intelligent and savvy leaders who are empathetic these leaders understand the status quo in which they exist 
and have the ability to strategize on ways to move the fellowship toward a common vision. These competencies are developed through training and experience. So we at CIPAR are actually seeking funding to establish a leadership um, consortium in the name of Lester Willery that will offer short courses to train pharmacists in the art and science of leadership. Those are my thoughts. I thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, Madam Chair, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Grizzle. We've had a mouthful there, or more than a mouthful. We'll not entertain many questions because I think we're up on, we've gone half an hour, so we've gone 50% more than our time. And I would dare say if we can't, if we cannot handle a lot of questions, what we will do is um, invite us all to come to the State of Pharmacy <laughs> program that we normally have. This year we missed it because it, came, it would have been just about the time when COVID started here. But we usually have that round table approximately in late March. February to so early March. Right. So I'd like to say something though. Hello? Yes. Uh, um, Dr. Allen? Yes, I'm Chris right, Allen. Can you give me one minute before you say? I Because I just needed to recognize, I didn't recognize individual members of the Allen's family. Uh, so there's, there was Trevor Allen. I mentioned Dr. Um, Elaine Foster Allen. And there is also Trevor Allen with us and Dr. Christopher Allen. And I must also use the opportunity to express significant and sincere condolences on the passing of your brother, Peter. Because Peter was always the one who was always with us. I yes. mean, like he used to be here every single year when nobody else is here. Peter has always been with us. And we really, uh, well, I didn't know before, no, but you know, it's really heartfelt. It's not just saying it from the lips, no. It's heartfelt because those of us have always been at um, Dr. Allen Young's memorial lecture would have known Peter and he's always with us. And we just pray God to continue to help you through that process. All right, go ahead, Dr. Allen. Thank you. I'm Chris Allen. I'm Grace's baby brother. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has afforded me the opportunity to participate in this wonderful symposium uh, for the first time. And uh, I truly enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, Grace has been and continues to be my guiding star. And uh, it's wonderful to see her remembered in this way. And I just wanted to thank the Pharmacy Society of Jamaica, the Pharmacy Council, the UTEP alumni for honoring her in this way. Thanks a lot. Welcome, Dr. Allen, and we're happy to have had you. And going forward, we know we'll have you more often because this will be a regular part, whether or not COVID disappears or whether we go back to normal, at least we know we'll be able to use this platform from time to time. Any other questions out there? I'm seeing some comments in the chat. Uh, good presentation, insightful, food for thought. Any questions though? Not questions, no. Miss Smith, but may I comment please? This is Tisa Harris Kid. Hi, Doc. Lady kid. <laughs> Not doctors yet. I just want Get to commend there. Dr. Grizzle um, and just to say that she has been one of them who has been coaching me, mentoring me. And um, it's so good to see her leading these organizations and leading change and newness even at her age. And I think it's quite commendable. I, I, I guess Dr. Grizzle, I have to say it and I want others on the platform to know that when she was dean of the college, I had an issue and it was a challenge for me. And how I handled the situation, Dr. Grizzle recommended I chaired the College Academic Advisement Unit, which was a big change, a significant game changer. And I'm happy that she saw that potential in me. Um, also, my first articles to be published, Dr. Grizzle co-authored and edited my first Gleaner article, my first Observer article, and I am now able to co-author with other persons because of the guidance she has embedded within me as an individual. So I really want to say to others on the platform, in helping others, you help yourself. And Dr. Grizz, I really want to thank you on everything on the platform today, was very good, Shamika. I will be reaching out to you. 
I'd love to know the compounding practices in Canada because that's something I would love to bring to our Jamaican context. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Kidd. I just saw something that chat from Andrea Daly. Andrea Daly. From Bahamas. Oh. Great to have you. Great to have you with us today. Yes, good afternoon, all. It was such a pleasure. This is Van. <laughs> For those of you who don't know. Yes. Hi, Van Rio. Yes, how is everyone? <laughs> we are doing well. Surprise, surprise. To have you. Surprise. Yes. Right. Was there another question out there? Comment, Doctor Daly. Um, thank you very much, uh, Alicia. Thank you, Doctor Grizzle. And um, we come from the school after this presentation, and for it being so enlightening, it's always good to go back into the history and see where we're coming from, so we can we can appreciate what we can how we, how we go forward and to learn from those who went on before us. And also, too, as you had put in there, I liked how you said put into the past, going into the past, the history to, to move forward. The School of Pharmacy was, was, continues to be thankful for the UPA to pour in and invest in our students. This year, as you had seen, we're shipping uh, one of our pharmacy technicians, pharmacy, pharmaceutical um, science, Bachelor of Science in Pharmaceutical Technology. We were still recipient, well, those recipient her, for them were, it was actually four, not three students who were um, the privilege to have received this help at the time of need due to an unfortunate situation that happened. Um, but it was the UPA that, that the cry came to and, the, and, and they responded. So we continue to be very um, gracious and thankful. We continue to lift up the gen. The Canadians, the Jan, <laughs> the Jan, Jack Canadians, <laughs> to to Shemika, to San keeps on keeps on. Even if we don't remember, Shemika is there telling us, "Oh, it's coming up. This is where the bank is. This is where it's going. This is what we're going to be doing." And so some of us may not have realized that it started with one recipient, and then two, and then it went up. It went up, and so more and more of them got involved. And so we are grateful for that as well. Mm -hmm. And just to, just to, just to say, um, Shemika, we are, we're doing a presentation for, um, we're doing a talk on professionalism for our students right across the college for Pharmacy Week. And Shemika is one of our, is our guest speaker for our students. Oh, so <laughs> she's going to be there for us. Uh, so this is just a series we wanted to, to bring in terms of professionalism to our students and we said what better way to start with one of ours who has been abroad to just bring another light to our students at this time. So we continue to again school of arms to be very grateful to the UPH for pouring to our students and just to say that as what I want to say also is that sometimes it's good to know that they do, we, we, um, students get grant, there's grants out there and sometimes scholarships but ladies and gentlemen sometimes these have um, specific criteria and most times the criteria is that they need a 3.2.7, 3.0 GPA, GPA average. I must say from my point, you cannot expect a child who is having financial situations or unhealthy home life to really aspire to a 2.7 or 3.0 just like that. So when a scholarship comes up or a grant comes up with just to bless or just to give without a criteria, we are very grateful. Yes, we have must aspire to those who want uh, who are high achievers, and I'm not saying that, but I, it's just good sometimes to get those scholarships, those grants that there's no criteria, and then they'll just give the students an incentive to, an encouragement to just, um, at some, to get some help. So we, are, we continue to, to very, 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 very grateful for this the UPA to report it to our students. And so I can thank everyone for it. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Okay, nobody else to say anything at this time. Okay. Hello, this is Van. I know you saw Anne Roll come up, but that's me. Um, I just want to say hi, special hi to everyone. Especially mm -hmm. Dawn and Dr. Daly, how are you? Dr. 
Hey, Dr. Rowan. Long well, time. Uh, Dr. Brown, Mary, and everyone. Uh, good, to, good to hear you all. I haven't Manuel. seen you. Hi, Noel. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Good to hear you. Yeah, man, we, we don't get to see each other anymore, but it is what it is, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll do so soon, I'm sure. Yes, yes, we must, we must. COVID won't stay forever. No, 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 but then this is still a good forum, eh? For us to meet. Like someone said, you know, the participation is, is great because everyone could just use the technology to communicate. So that's a good thing, I guess, in a way. All right, thank you, Van. Okay, uh, it is now 6.40. Alicia, so 40 minutes I had there. a question, Alicia. Oh, is that Shereen? Yes. What Hi, Shereen. Good to have you. Yeah, and I think I deserve to have my question answered. Go, go ahead, Almost Shereen. 1 a.m. <laughs> where I am. <laughs> oh. Dr. Grizzle, um, thank you for a wonderful presentation, um, as always. And I have been asking this question for years, and I keep hearing that one will be coming. When are you going to? put together that book on the history of pharmacy in Jamaica. <laughs> so, yeah. um, it has been between yourself, Vivine, and see, Aline um, Gray is gone now. Let Mr. Woolery used to talk, he's gone now. And um, Mr. Kincaid, who used to mention the history a lot, I had the pleasure of working with him, he's gone. And with COVID-19 now, so many persons are going that we don't even want or expect um, sorry to make, say it like that, but I really think um, the work of those who have gone before and those who are still with us ought to be recognized um, in something like that. So I, I am still asking that question and I think I'll keep asking it until it's done. When is that book going to happen? I see here we are one was done by Dr. Dr. Mrs. Reed and Dr. Brown Mary. I just There's saw a that. book on the history. I'm not aware of it. Where focusing is that? It's, it's, coming. it's coming. It's coming. It's focusing on education, though, Doctor Grizzer. You have much more to add to that. <laughs> so okay. that part that I don't know, you have to put it in. You have to write your book. Please yes, let me know when it's available. I would love to get a copy of it. Um, the first year I precepted here in Alberta, I actually got a copy of the history of pharmacy. Um, in Alberta. So I would love to get a, his, a copy of the history of pharmacy in Jamaica. I hear you. We've got work to okay. do. Okay, Jamelia, we will we'll let you know when it is ready. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Okay, time is far spent. I'm going to ask Dr. Winsome Christie just say a thank you before we head off our beds or wherever else we go at this time of a Sunday evening. Okay, good evening everyone. Thank you Alicia for asking me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues, this has really been a very stimulating and educational afternoon. This Grace Allen Young Memorial Lecture is definitely going to be a, a memorial in our minds on all this rich information that we have received. We have really seen how there are so many different perspectives on pharmacy leadership. So I'd really like to thank, I'm certain I can say thank you on behalf of this audience here who I know are very appreciative and grateful for the information that they have received during this lecture. To our two uh, Dr. Grizzle, of course, was the main guest speaker, but the Janadian pharmacist in the person of Ms. Shemika Wright and Dorian, they really sent us to the moon. All the advances they were doing and the leadership, they have, leadership role they have taken in propelling pharmacy forward in the Alberta, Ontario and other regions of Canada and as alumni of UTEC we all are proud of the contributions that, are, that they are making there and as we see they are already 
making, promising to make contributions to our Jamaican setting. To Dr. Grizzle, who, just like the Americans now who are preparing to launch, she really launched us to the moon. We were, we were there when we listened to all these history of pharmacy, all these great leaders such as James Corey, Jeff Thompson, Mr. Vaughan, Mr. Leslie Woolery, Valerie Germain, and of course she was, she, her name should be in that pack too. <laughs> and she still is going. We really appreciated her knowledge as she imparted to us information on leadership, on the leadership styles, and then the actual experience that we have in Jamaica, how we now are here as pharmacists with our practices because we're standing on the shoulders of all these great giants before us. Her, her lecture was indeed inspiring. As you can see by the comments in the, in the box, people are saying, asking questions, when is this gonna be? When? She really has whet our appetite and has stimulated us to move forward with, with the great ideas. To all those who were instrumental in making this event a success, I mentioned before um, Ms. Shamika Wright and her team, but our partners like the Pharmaceutical Society of Jamaica, the Pharmacy Council of Jamaica, the College, College of Health Sciences, and of course, Dr. Alan Young's family, we appreciate their attendance every year. And we, are, we want to express condolence for their loss at this time. To the committee members who are always behind the scenes assisting to put forward these um, seminars these, and these lectures, we want to express our thanks. And of course, Dr. Grizzle will spearhead all of these. To the participants in the different regions, Cayman, Barbet, Bahamas, we heard some of them speak. We thank you all for attending. And of course, our local colleagues, we thank you for coming and our friends and well wishers. Thank you all for coming. And it really was a pleasure for me to offer this vote of thanks since I really benefited very much. Goose pimples were on me when I listened to the Jamaican pharmacist and Dr. Grizzle was, I nearly got up out of my seat to say, yes, 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 you know? So I really enjoyed it myself. So thank you to all and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Dr. Christie. And with that said, I guess there's nothing more for me to say, but Godspeed. Um, those who are on the road who need to get home should, like myself, should attempt to do so as quickly as possible. Um, but for most of you, you're in your places of abode. God bless, have a good week, and we will see you soon. And we hope that you spread the word that the next function of this can we have, it will not be the we're selling a young lecture because that won't be until next year this time. But we really are hoping that we'll be able to have the State of Pharmacy Roundtable discussion in March next year. And know that we have this platform, we know the sky is the limit. So thank you all for being around and God bless. Good night.